thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, all, it, it, it definitely, like I said before, great to be here. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for allowing me to come in and hang out uh, via, uh, via, you know, our, our video conferencing software here with Zoom. A um, lot of Zoom events, a lot of a lot of Microsoft Teams events lately. Ever since last March, right? Um, so it's been it's been cool. Uh, it's been fun. Um, everything I was doing last March, because you know April is National Poetry Month. So everything I was I thought I was doing in March, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm planning for April. It's gonna be good to go. Okay, COVID. Okay, what? Oh, now we got a shelter in place. Oh, we can't go out. Okay, so all all that stuff is done. So everything for April and you know since has been done. But it was kind of cool because you got to see how people went to the online forums. Like people just kind of gravitated. They kind of like transformed their events to like Zoom events and Teams events and things like that. And so um, that's the way I've been staying busy, you know, as a, as a public poet. You know, you have to be kind of be out there and be social and, and uh, do the readings and the signings and things like that. Um, so this kind of be my, my, my kind of my, my bridge, I guess. Um, but today, of course, I want to jump into, you know, uh, poetry about the Black family. Um, and like I said earlier, um, a lot of poetry I started writing about, about my family came mostly um, when I was away at school. You know, I went to school and I, I grew up in California, Southern California. I ended up <clears throat> going to college at, at uh, Goddard College in Vermont. And so this place, I mean, it's very very cold, um, not many black folks up there at all. Um, but I knew I was going just to get my education correct because I knew that if I wanted to be successful as a writer, as a poet, I had to get these, these, you know, I had to, I had to wrestle with academia. I had to get in there. I had to wrestle with these degrees. And so, cause most of the poets I knew and read about, they were, they were teaching, they were teaching, they were, they were writing, they were publishing. That's kind of what the, 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 the cycle was. Um, and I know I, I originally got introduced to poetry by Shel Silverstein, uh, fourth grade, uh, Long Beach, California. My, my fourth grade teacher used to read this stuff every afternoon. Um, and I fell in love with the words, with the pictures, with the illustrations. I waited for that part of the day. And since then, poetry has kind of been in the back of my mind, you know, since, since that point. And then when I got to high school, of course, it's all about, you know, OK, um, junior year, senior year, what are you going to do? You know, are you are you? going to college? Are you working? Are you going to the military? What are you going to end up doing? Um, and so I kind of like relied on the poetry and on the creative writing aspect. And that's why I went off to college. Um, but, you know, today I just wanted like, I want to focus in, narrow in on some of the poems about, you know, family life and everything like that. Um, and like I said before, like I started writing poetry about family when I was away at college and I didn't want to like, I, I'm not a big gift buyer when it comes to Christmas. Like at that point I wasn't. Um, you know, and now that I have a nine-year-old daughter, like I have to be about that business, right? I have to, <laughs> I have to make sure that she's taken care of. I won't hear the end of it. Um, but anyway, um, I used to write a lot of poetry to my family members around Christmas time and frame them, put them in these frames, wrap them up in like you know paper, and I would send them off because I, 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 at that point, I wasn't really coming home as much. Um, and then later on, like around the time I was getting my master's. Um, that's when I was able to kind of like go back and forth and, and I was still doing the poems. And even to last Christmas, I wrote poems, I put them in the frames. It's almost like a tradition. Uh, now I just do it every, every, um, every Christmas time. Um, but I wanted to start off with a poem that, um, and it's pretty cool that we're doing Zoom because from my perspective, I've been on both sides of this thing, all right? Uh, teaching, lecturing, all right? And then being an audience member and being a participant. I was like, okay, what do I like to see at a Zoom? video and I love, you know, I have loved the transitions of stuff, you know, videos and, and the PowerPoints and, and things like that, um, which which have kept my attention, but every audience is different, of course, right? All right, so I wrote this up uh, this morning um, and I'm normally, you know, and I see you recording this, I normally don't do this, it's kind of breaking my rule here where, you know, um, I usually in, in a performance of any type, I've, I've you know, uh, I've, wrestle with the poem. I recited the poem like 50 times before I even get to the event. Um, I wrote this a couple of hours ago and, and I, it was just something I do every morning. I write every morning. Um, and it happened to be a poem about, you know, um, something my father um, has said. All right. Um, and it's simply called Reflecting on Something Daddy Said. <clears throat> Daddy said, commit to the journey, the struggle, or destiny created by fingertips that designed, that 
that they designed before your path ever materialized. Before it materialized, you were the jazz in the eye, a forced change in your mother's dreams. Now life has too many spaces to occupy, so living in boxes is not ideal. I understand the heart beats for freedom, beats for tomorrow, and family ties play the bass in this band. The DNA stretches my smile like cold train finding his way through my favorite things. My favorite things begin with words and music and taking visions out of my pockets, hoping they climb into gray sky and beautify. The bonds that we develop create a unique synergy, a unique staying power, and a laughter and the gentle aromas that climb out of cast iron pots. Poem is simply entitled Reflecting on Something My Daddy Said. And that's a rough reading. That's a rough reading <laughs> because the, uh, I scratched it out on, uh, on the page, on, on in my notebook there. Um, but anyway, um, that was just one poem I wanted to show you um, all. And now, like, I want to show you really quickly. Um, I think I got everything queued up here. Let me make sure everything is uh, where it's supposed to be. And I want to show you. Um, one of, I, I, I've, a lot of my work, you know, for those who don't know, a lot of my work is, is recorded material. All right. It's all recorded. Um, 90% of it, at least, you know, I, I, I say that 10% for the books because people love to read, um, read, love to read books and, and there's, there's quality or there's a, uh, there's something there, um, uh, as far as the interaction with people, like some people like to read books and some people like to listen. And I kind of got that when when maybe like 10 years ago where you know um i was in a coffee shop and some of my books were present you know on the counter and uh, a guy asked me you know can i hear some of your work and um it's like i was like yeah you know one of my books you know is right there on the on the counter he's like no i got it i have to hear it like i you know, reading is one thing but i want to hear poetry i want to be moved by poetry and i saw that there was something there that i had to kind of like uh tap into i always knew my work was oral um, but at the same time, I didn't know how much the audience valued that, you know. So I, you know, I really started gravitating more to like the recording and everything, and then also having the book, you know, from time to time, uh, so people can kind of take a look at at, at that material. Um, but all, m ninety percent of my work is recorded. Um, there's a song I recorded to a lot of music, R and B, um, some hip hop, lo-fi hip hop, not like the the overly produced stuff. More of the stuff um, that is, uh, I guess you would say, early '80s, the pioneering type stuff. Um, spare, you know, very sparse. Couple of instruments. Nowadays, you got four or five instruments, kind of like banging together, and then the vocal, and then it's kind of like drowned out. I'm all about like, you know, the vocal. Can you hear the vocal and, and things? Um, jazz is my favorite. Um, so I want to play you a song. I'm going to show you my screen in one second. I want to play you a song, and it, and it basically, um, it's about actually. It's it's from what's called the Muse Writing Center here in um, I'm in Chesapeake. 15 minutes from me is Norfolk, um, and so there's a place called the Muse Writing Center uh, where um, you know, I teach classes there from time to time to pretty much um, mostly teenagers. It's a community-based grassroots kind of place, but it's amazing. You know, it has its own library. It's got plenty of space in here to um, um, get around and do readings and things like that. Um, so um, I had to develop a a video. Um, a, a 10 minute video, max, 10 minute max video of uh, storytelling through my craft, through my, through my art. And so of course I use poetry and I use this one song and I narrated over that um, particular song um, to kind of talk about, you know, why I made the decisions I, I did when producing the song. All right, so I'm gonna show you that right now and I'm gonna go right to, um, this is my official website here. Um, and Chaz, I, I, I remember you said, when I said something on Facebook about WordPress, like I listen, like Word, <laughs> WordPress was was something to deal with. It was a bear <laughs> um, to figure out. But like once I once I was able to was able to figure it out, um, I kind of like you know started to like it a little bit. Actually, let me stop my. It looks good. My share, but um, let me share it one more time because I want to make sure. I know with Zoom you got to click that share sound button. There we go. All right, so here we go. All right, so this is my official website. It's called officialseneca.com. Um, and so, like I said, WordPress was 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 insane, but it was it was there was something gratifying about it. It was something about okay, let me stick to it. Okay, three days, four days, 
five days. Okay, now I get it. Now I get it. Now I get the rhythm. I get the structure. Okay, I'm going to work this. <laughs> I'm going to work this. So um, this is my official website, but I want to play this quick uh, quick clip. We already queued it up. Um, this is a video called Talk To You Remix, and it features my wife and my uh, daughter. They're, they're actually in the video, and I think you might hear my daughter speaking uh, for a little bit as well. I right, say it's only like, like a couple minutes. Another way I explore resistance and identity is through the images that appear in my videos. I carefully select the content in an effort to control how I present myself to a larger audience because mainstream television executives, movie executives, and even some media outlets tend to focus on stereotypes and negative attributes that they think represent African-American life or the urban landscape. In this video, Talk To You, I asked the videographer, Alexander J, to focus on positive black images of family life. And no, those ladies are not actresses. My wife, Elisa, and my daughter, Zuri, got in on the action. Some smiles have wings that are broader than the sun. Some touches speak a language that only two people understand. I understand your presence is a gift neatly wrapped in God's plans. I shed my inhibitions when your personality demonstrates how beauty is crafted through liquid fingertips with careful sparks, with precision intelligence. That everything of you is relevant to the intricate way I breathe. Hey to your breath, to your unique identity, fusing itself with my consciousness. Love is a familiar sight, a familiar place that you and I create from non-verbal dialogue. I recognize your fire, steadily blazing beneath the roots of my feet. Just to talk to your inviting composition, your divine makeup, I realize you're my other half the rest of my life. This is a real <laughs> In 2019, I drove out to. Okay, all right. Let me stop my share. All right, so yeah, so that is is the talk to you remix, and and one of the main um the main main objectives behind it was, of course, to like you know portray you know the black family you know as a unit and as a positive you know a positive uh, a positive family unit. And I think um sometimes you know we may miss that you know and I think I learned a lot about that when I ended up going to Vermont and going to school in Vermont where where I didn't realize the power of media uh, until I ran into some people who said they've never interacted with anybody like of color of any sort, right? African-American, Asian, Hispanic, or other, you know, they had just no experience. And um, knowing that how, knowing the power of media and how media can present like, you know, these these very negative attributes, because, you know, we know media is sensationalized and, and Things of that nature, we have to kind of go in and do the work to really get to the, the heart of a story. Um, sometimes, you know, some people they just they see the negative so much that they assume that, or they associate the negative with you know the actual person when they see that type of person, um, which I think is you know definitely interesting. But at the same time, I was like, well, once I, once I get into a space where I can control you know my narrative and control my story, I want to make sure all of that is present. I want to make sure the positive images are present. I want to make sure that I'm carrying myself in, in the right light, you know, when it when it comes to like, you know, exploring um, black family life. Um, but anyway, um, if anybody's in here, I mean, well, uh, folks that are in here, if you want to ask questions, 
You can throw them in the chat. Please feel free. And I like to make this interactive as possible. Um, you know, uh, I think that's always you know, something that kind of carries uh, overall, overall well on the online experience. So if you got any questions about the content, um, any comments about the videos, anything that you see, feel free to put them in the chat. And I can just read them out loud. Or, you know, if you want to unmute yourselves, um, there used to be a raise hand icon button at the bottom of Zoom. I don't see it down there. Um, but that's okay. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, yeah, throw them in the chat area and I will definitely answer them, you know, as I uh, see them. But I'll, um, I'll keep moving though. All right, so the first poem, or the well, second poem, I guess, uh, is, is a poem I, I picked out from, you know, it's one of my, like, I have like a dozen or so books. It's called Poems for the People. Um, and this poem is called um, A Star on My Skin. Mama prepares the meals, crafts the wings on my back, whispers the sounds of resistance, self-defense, and culture into my tiny ears. Life is precious when living in society's crosshairs. I eat and grow into a predator for peace, for love, for justice. I walk on dangerous soil, a star in my mouth, an electric spirit behind my words and eyes, Words climb through me and offer answers to conditions, to prayers, to rage, to the system. I make an attempt at honesty. The residue of brutality drips in infectious motion, plants tomorrow's fight, and grows roots. Simply call a star on my skin. Latif, what's up, bro? How did you learn how to combine poetry and activism? Good question, man. Good question. Like, around... Um, I learned uh, when I really got into studying the craft of poetry, right? When I went off to, went off to college. Like, and of course, before that, my, my experiences with poetry, mostly self Seristine stuff when I was very young. Um, and of course, you get to, to high school and of course, they, they teach you the, 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 the classics, right? They take you through the English Renaissance, right? The Italian Renaissance, the Romantics. And you know, it's very European, very, very European as far as form is concerned. Um, but I think once people started to really talk about um, the poetry of hip hop, the poetry of, of rap, the poetry of even Tupac Shakur, right? I think I, I started a turn, right, towards like, okay, um, black poetry, African American poetry. We have our own traditions. We have our own ways of, of describing events and places and, and conditions, right? Um, and so once I started turning there, and started reading things like the autobiography of Malcolm X, it, it kind of like started to make sense. Like I, I was like, well, I, I can combine social issues. I can combine activism. I can combine how I feel about society inside of the poem, right? And then once I got to college and the craft came in there, it was like, okay, now I'm being introduced to people like uh, Mary Baraka, right? Sonia Sanchez, all these 1960s black arts people, even some of the folks of the 50s, you know, Jack Kerouac, just the way they, they used words on the page. So Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those folks uh, were, were definitely big uh, influences on me. Um, and so when I was in college, I studied poetry, the craft of poetry, and I studied like, like uh, social consciousness, you know, I studied liberation movements. So like, for six years, I was just immersed in that environment. So it never, I could never avoid talking about society or, or politics or race or class or culture. I, I could never avoid that stuff. It had to be in there. Um, and then later on, once I got married, of course, once I got married, I had a child, right? You know, I started seeing, you know, I, was, I, well, I don't have to write simply about this. I can write about being, you know, uh, being with my best friend you know, marrying my best friend and having a daughter. What does that, what does that mean as a father? All right, so that's when it all started to make sense and it all started to come around uh, because a professor of mine, she said, um, so she said, Seneca, you think you're writing well now? Wait till, wait till you become, uh, wait till the experience of the Wait till you go through some, some troubling situations. Wait till you, wait till you experience that um, a loss in the family. All of that is going to shape who you are as, as, a, as a person uh, and as a, as a writer. All right, so yeah, to answer your question, Latif, like it just kind of like you know, um, once I really got into college and it took off, and I started studying the uh, the theory. Uh, once I started studying, you know, these these black consciousness movements and revolutionary movements, it all just kind of like uh, started to synergize, like a really cool, like I don't know, 
a, a cool jazz trio finding that 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 zone together, you know. All right, Latif, Latif says, if, if I want to be a writer, but I do not have a lot of money, how can I learn the craft of writing? Good question. Good question. The best way, the best teachers, the best teachers um, uh, definitely are on the bookshelves. The best teachers are on the bookshelves. I had a really good um, college experience where um, it, a lot of the, the we, we had to, we got to choose the type of books we wanted to read. And then we had to get approval from the professor. That professor didn't like you know, your choices, he or she would just say, okay, we're going to get rid of those four and five. We're going to give you these because, you know, I want you to study the craft, you know? So I started with, um, like I, I had a book of poetic forms and I just read it, you know, back to front. And I tried to find my place within, um, those poetic forms. I, I tried to figure out like what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, and I went with, and that's what I went with. Um, and then, and then what's really interesting when I start really look into the craft of writing. Um, I know the team, I know you remember like, um, and, and Chad, you probably too, like a lot of the younger generation, they don't really get to, um, um, they don't get the enjoyment of buying the CD, right? Remember you go into the, you know, FYE used to have A through Z, rows, rows, rows of CDs. You know, now it's like five. <laughs> it's five rows of CDs and these are all the genre, we're gonna put all the genres. In. But I, I, I mentioned that because the liner notes, the liner notes in my favorite artists' albums inspired me so much. I used to read the lyrics of like, you know, Bob Marley. I used to read the lyrics of like, say, R&B superstar Maxwell. And just the way they used the language and, and, and uh, printed their words on, on the page, I was like, wow, there's something, there's, a, uh, there's something that's so relatable to the way musicians uh, write their lyrics, print their lyrics, and then to the poets I was studying at the time. Because if you read Langston Hughes or anybody like that, you know, he's a, he's a notorious blues poet. Blues rhythms, you know, it's all throughout the poetry, you know. Um, and so that's when I really started learning about, you know, uh, craft and style from those folks. But I started with a book of forms, Latif, um, and depending on your genre, you know, there are there, there are tons of like, you know, there's a, a huge self-help section in um, Barnes and Noble, and you can probably get online and Google, like, you know, um, the different types of forms. But for me, the best teachers when it comes to craft and the craft of writing, it was really the people in the bookshelves. I just read a thousand writers. I read a thousand writers, not like thousand, like 500 writers. And I saw, I said to myself, okay, I like what Walt Whitman's doing. I love what Langston Hughes is doing, right? But I love the fact that, you know, a person like Sonia Sanchez, you can read her poetry one way. And then when you see her perform, oh my God, it's a completely mind blowing, um, a mind blowing experience. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's that was my start when it came to like you know delving into the craft uh, of writing. Um, let me see what else I have here. I have um, when uh, my wife, you know, she's been um, she developed cancer a couple of years ago, um, and she's been she's been in remission you know, for, for a little while now, still taking some meds um, to kind of like, you know, keep her, keep her system fighting, right, um, and things of that nature. Um, when she developed cancer, right, it was, it was, it was a small, like, you know, uh, mass, right, small mass in the breast, right, um, and they classified, it was really like a, uh, like a stage one, all right, um, but she had to have surgery, so they bumped it up to a stage two, um, because, you know, there's some other parts they couldn't see, so they couldn't really make out, make out what was happening. So, um, they bumped to a stage two, you know, insurance purposes. Um, she ended up getting this, um, Metaport installed in the chest, all right, which, which delivered the chemotherapy to her, all right? She went through one round of that, one round, seven days later, I was, I was, I called the ambulance, you know, I'm in Chesapeake, you know, VA, called the ambulance, I'm right next door to the hospital. They get, they come get her, they pull, they take her, take her in. She's in ICU. I, her, her, you know, her immune system was zapped. You know, you know, it was zapped. She couldn't fight off, couldn't fight off anything. So she had this infection um, and they had literally had to bring her back, you know, get her levels back up. And it took a full 24 hours um, to get, get her up to a level where like, you know, she was out of that danger zone, but she literally stayed in the hospital. I kid you not about a month, all right, about a month. All right. But those first few days were definitely trying and traumatic. And so I wrote a lot of poems during those days. All right. Um, let me see. I wrote uh, I was writing in 
these are these are poems that she won't read because she doesn't want to relive that experience. Um, but those experiences were are, are completely vivid to me. Um, so this this first poem is called um, "Sleeping in a Chair at Chesapeake Regional Medical Center." A little insane, delirious and dizzy from spending the night in a cold chair. A slight glimmer from the television screen speaks with a gentle language. I await news from the nurse. An infected metaport put my baby in the ICU. My head is stable, the world whirls, crashes, flips. The home needs to remain strong for the little one. I'm the rock or the steady blues rhythm that saves, that creates hope for the moment. She fights for her, for us, for family. God knows the conditions. I hear his melody when I kneel to pray, to talk, to live, to protect. Poem entitled Sleeping in a Chair at Chesapeake Regional Medical Center. And these poems, they were fast and furious. They were fast and furious. It was, it was all, you know, it was, it was just my way of dealing with the situation. Um, because they were saying, like, listen, they were saying, Mr. Lofton, you know, we glad you brought her in. And, and at that point, which is really interesting, um, it was the last day of, of school, all right? Um, I, I think it was like a, it was a, it was the last meeting of the school year. Um, you know, I teach literature, Chesapeake Bay Academy during the day, then I'm adjunct faculty at Norfolk State, been there for about 10 years now. Um, I've been doing, doing it, doing that for the last about 13 years, both, both schools. All right, so um, it was the last day of, I think we were having a meeting and my wife, you know, that entire week, I remember her eating a Five Guys cheeseburger um, on a Tuesday, or Monday or Tuesday. Um, I thought she just fell ill from eating the, the burger and, and she was just completely, you know, I was monitoring her movements the whole week. Um, and so her movements were different. She wasn't moving as much. She wasn't moving, she needed help doing everyday things like eating breakfast, like lifting the spoon to her mouth to eat some cereal. Like it was that serious. And I was like, listen, I'm just going to this quick meeting. You know, can you type and let me know if you, if you need me, if it's an emergency? And she showed me she could do it. So I'm like, okay, she's good. Um, and she had a doctor appointment like that following Monday. And it was like a Friday. It was a, it was a Friday, I think. Um, so I went and, and went to the meeting. And all in the back of my mind, I'm like, I need to be at home. I need to be at home, this meeting. They don't need me for this meeting. They can put this in some notes and send them to email. They don't need me. So in my mind, I was like, I'm going to go home. Um, and then I told my wife I was coming home. I texted her and she texted me something back and it was complete gibberish. Right? I couldn't make out what it was. And in my mind, red, red flag. Right. So in my mind, so it's a red flag. And um, it was a red flag in my mind. And uh, and and so what ended up happening, I, I I was trying to debate on calling an ambulance. Um, if you can't, just make sure you um you, you mute yourselves when you when you enter in um, for me. Thank you. Uh, and uh, in my mind, I was like, well, okay, I need to I need to get her to the hospital, right? But then at the same time, like I'm asking myself, you know, my daughter is uh you know she's I can't remember how old she was at the time, maybe seven. Um, I was like, would that be too traumatic of an experience, you know, to have my daughter at home and then the ambulance come pick up ballet. I got to get her to the hospital. Um, and thankfully, my, my my daughter wasn't there. So I called my mother-in-law. I was like, listen, I'm going to just call the ambulance and just come and get her. And they came and got her. They got her to the hospital. And they said, Mr. Lawton, we glad you brought her in because if you'd have brought her in on a Sunday or a Monday, right, you might be planning for a funeral. Those were the exact words from the doctors. Those are the exact words. I swear, I kid you not. Um, and then um, once I was in that building, you know, all these, these poems kind of came uh, these poems kind of came rushing out. I think I want to read one more from that particular period. Um, let's see here. Uh, I had family strict this work ethic. Let's see if I can find it here. There's one called, um, and it's about the breast cancer, which is really interesting. And it might not be in this. Yes, it is. All right. I'm glad I put a table of contents in this one. Sometimes in books, I don't put a table of contents and stuff. All right, so this is called um, A Monster Called Breast Cancer. All right, it's written around the same period. I wrote, I wrote a, like um, at least 10 or 20 of these, these things. Um, and I just kind of pull them out from time to time. And of course, she won't read them all. All right, so this is called A, Mon a Monster Called Breast Cancer. A downward spiral. The speed is akin to an uncontrolled plunge into a medical sunken place. 
We are a blues people. We speak sun words. We didn't ask for this. We didn't ask for this. The Most High is too kind to put his children in a condition, too kind to put his lesser gods in a fight to merely exist with infections, bacteria, incessant beeps in the night, machines designed to keep the body cool. We are a blues people. Speak sun words, we didn't ask for this, we didn't ask for this. I observe her struggle to breathe, her cough scares me, but the nurse says this is progress. This is a road to a solution, to health, to wellness. My baby is a fighter, my baby is a dreamer, she's equipped to slay beasts. The monster called breast cancer. Yeah, and those came, those those particular poems they came uh they, they were fast and furious at that time, um and and I was just trying to like pretty much just kind of deal with the situation the best way I could and the best way I could at that point was uh just you know uh, be there be there for her and then just kind of keep my head down in my notebook and for some reason I said to myself she's gonna want to read about this stuff later. Um, and then when she finally got better, she was like, I don't want to read about that. Stuff. I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to relive any of that. Right. You know, um, and, and we had a conversation last night about, you know, these poems because I, I wrote a couple. Now I read a couple last night uh, for the students uh, at Mission College. Um, and then she's like, yeah, I heard you mention me in there in the other room. What were you talking about? I was like, oh, we were talking about, you know, um, you know, your breast cancer and things like that. And like, you know, you know she was like, yeah, I have, you know. You know, she wasn't interested in reading those particular poems, even hearing about those particular poems. Um, but, um, yeah, so this poem, uh, simply called Family Strengthens Work Ethic. The bond and the hustle share kinship, connection, blood. Some connections create urgency and responsibility and obligation. This is an integral part of the instinct, that part which intensifies the ambition to walk, to fly, to succeed, to protect. I arm myself with knowledge, wisdom, and the power of insight. I stay inspired and motivated while I break this cage. Family strengthens work ethic. Could, could you maybe talk a little bit about your process? And, and one thing that really, yeah. I mean, this is always your poetry, but it really strikes me that like so much of this seems about you using using poetry and using um performance as a way of like making sense of the world right yeah absolutely absolutely like you know um it, it's really interesting because like when when i first graduated college this was 2004 i first you know i, I was heavily immersed in um theory and the and the and the and the, uh, the the practice, right? I was actually it was more theory than anything, because I guess when you're in college, you just you know your your head is in books, right? Um, and so as as I'm reading all these particular books and 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 reading these, these these particular styles of poets, reading about all these resistant movements, whether they are in America or in other parts of the, of the world, you know, um, I'm I'm at the same time I'm practicing, right? And that was the one thing that was different about me, you know. I went to school, like you know. It, Goddard College is one of those colleges, uh, definitely um, off the beaten path, definitely non-traditional. Um, they had they made jokes about the kids that went there. Um, they they called us all card carrying communists, and this like wasn't like just people in the neighborhood. Like when I first time I got radio play was in Burlington, Vermont, um, and I, I think I said like it was it was some poems that were mixed by a DJ from Brooklyn. And and I sent some poems up there. I didn't know what was to expect. I just couldn't put myself out there. I remember the DJ that day said, he said, oh, yeah, now we have um, a featured local artist that I'm about to play, you know, coming to us from little little Moscow on the hill. I mean, that's literally what he said on the radio. That <laughs> that particular day was just kind of crazy. Um, but um, when I was at Goddard, I, I immersed myself in, in process, in craft. Uh, trying to find my own original voice. I think that's what I think that's what most artists are trying to do. They're trying to find their own original voice um, so they can kind of share it with the world. You know, um, that's you know my, my my assumption. But that's what I was really trying to do. And like once I graduated, I think I had found my voice. And I wanted to break away from the traditional ways of not only writing poetry but the traditional ways of going about getting my poetry to the people. You know, um, but I definitely played both sides of the the. The coin, right? You know, I went 
the traditional route where I would submit poems to journals. I would submit poems to all the, you know, the, the quote unquote academic journals that would, you know, <clears throat> help me get into a, um, a position where I'm at a university or whatever. Um, and then I used the, you know, I was performing all the time. So since I was performing all the time, I had, I was, I was practicing it. And, and those people, they wanted work that they could take home. You know, they want to wait a year for a book to come out. You know, they wanted something they could take it home. So I was recording a lot. So a, a lot of poetry was coming out on CD. Um, a lot of chat books were coming out. Um, and, and so eventually I developed a process where, you know, I was, uh, I was combining traditional and non-traditional routes of getting my work, uh, to the people more so non-traditional, because at that point it was very, very, and it still is, it's still very, very easy to publish, right? It's very easy to, to, to put a book together and print it's, You can, you can literally write a book on a Monday edit it the following Monday and the next, you know, that Saturday you could submit it to Amazon. You can literally do it in like 14 days, right? Um, and, and what I've learned about that process is that you just have to make sure you have a, a quality proofreader. A qual Don't skip that process. Keep, get, that, get that proofreader, get that editor, get, get other eyes on your work. So you can say, okay, at least you, at least you took that step. You can say that at least. Um, and, and once you get that, you can put out a good quality book and you can kind of like really, um, get to, uh, you can establish an audience, uh, which is, which is really cool. But my process has pretty much been, been for the longest combining, um, lyrical poetry with like, with politics, with, with, you know, anything topical, you know, Dr. Seneca's topical poem of the week is literally, uh, uh that, you know, that manifestation. It's literally like, you know. I take a particular issue that I'm dealing with and it might not be, it might not be political. It might be something that, you know, I, I want to talk about purpose this week. I want to talk about living a purpose driven life this week or next week. Like, like we saw the violence in, 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 I don't know, on January 6th, I was like, okay, I want to talk about that a little bit. White rage, black folks, how black folks are dealing with this. And so it's very, it's a very uh, urgent. Uh, and I keep my finger kind of like on the pulse of what's, what's happening. And I love writing. I love that kind of process. I love being able to say, okay, let me take this right out of the media headlines. And, and how do I feel about it? You know, I want to write about it. I want to really express myself about it. And so, you know, in Dr. Seneca's topic of the poem of the week, you know, I, I really just go in, I, I make like a, I write a quick paragraph on the inspiration. Then I give people the poem, you know, and it's doing well. It, it was something that was supposed to be um, a, a podcast I literally just put on my, my official website. But at the same time, when I was in the school, they were grooming me. Um, I won't say they were grooming me. They, I got the opportunity to get in, involved with the radio, like terrestrial. Uh, the radio station was like 91.1 there. Um, and so it was first music I was getting into. And it was cool. I was playing all my favorite artists. But I was like, you know, I took a break after like a, like 158 episodes. It was something like ridiculous. Um, and I said, you know, I want to do something that's more, you know, expressive towards like what my my beliefs are, what my attitudes are about society. I think I, I owe myself that. Um, and so I submitted that same podcast. It's only like five minutes, right? A special edition, especially with that January 6th violence, um, two parts. It was like 10 minutes a piece, whatever. Um, I submitted that same um, uh, podcast idea through the, 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 the distribution that we have with Pacifica Network and uh, uh, yeah, I think it's Pacifica, Pacifica Audio or something like that. And all these stations, I kid you not, all these stations over the last, I started this in, in December, last two weeks of December, where I'm like on like the ninth episode. So it hasn't been that long. So like tip, like literally nine weeks. Um, I submitted, you know, all these radio stations across the country started picking it up. Um, so to date, there's been about 10 stations uh, from Maine to New Mexico, Connecticut, Kansas City picked up some station in Kansas City picked it up. Um, all over the country, these these stations they're picking up, and I know I'm noticing what they. I can look at my analytics and, and tell what they're gravitating to as far as content. Like, okay, they don't really like that that real political stuff. They like the stuff about living a purpose driven life kind of a thing, uh, more inspirational. Um, so my my process, like you know, it, it's it's completely. Um, it's completely urgent. It's completely topical, and it's it's well crafted. I believe it's well crafted because, like, I'm at the point now where I can pretty much gravitate to anything and, and pull it in and make sense of it. The only problem I think I have, Chad, Chaz, is like um, being being too immersed in one particular subject, 
right? You know, uh, if I write poems all week, right? I write poems, that's what I do. I write poems all week, I record poems all week. I write like, I average one poem a day, I record two poems. That's kind of like what my, my, my average is right now. And all those poems might not be good, but that, that's my process. <laughs> that's the process, like, you know, I get a good, you know, seven poems, seven to 10 poems at the end of the week. Three of them may be good. Three of them may be worth me reading, you know, online or at a, at a performance. The other ones might need some work, or I might not even go back and work up, work with them. It might just be, I'll just, you know, chalk it up to process. Okay, I got, I, I put in 10 poems, I got three. Good week, good week, I'll take that, right? Um, but that's, that's normally how my, my process has, has, has gone. Um, and so I learned most of my craft um, at the college level, all the academic stuff. And then when, when it's time to like practice, right, after, you know, college is over, um, that's when I really started to like hone in on the type of topics I love to talk about. And I knew it was coming from a good place because I already set up the foundation. The foundation was the theory, all right? You study the movements, you study the Harlem Renaissance, you study the 50s, you study like, you know, uh, uh, writers after the American Revolution. You study all these writers, you know, and then you say to yourself, okay, I think it's time for me to develop a craft and develop a style that works for me. And I think that's the way I've, uh, that's the attitude I've taken, like, you know, since that point. But that, that's, that's my process. Um, like I said, if anybody had any questions, you know, throw them in the, in the chat. Um, well, Chaz, how long are we going? We're going to, is it to three o'clock? I, I, I was thinking an hour. Yeah. Oh, by the way, okay. if anyone wants to, um, this is just a regular old Zoom meeting. So anyone can talk and turn your camera on and participate. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely, absolutely. Can I? So, um, just uh, I don't, I'm, I don't want to take the server, but I just had another thing I wanted to ask you. Oh, go um, ahead. So, one thing I notice is that there are a lot of students who have interest and tendencies toward kind of the creative and humanity side of the house here. I mean, you know, and the academic side of the house. Um, but there's so much social pressure and there's so much economic pressure to to do other things, right? To do and no, no offense to like the professional majors or um, you know STEM and all that kind of stuff. But I, I guess what advice or what 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 would you what do you say to to, to students who have interest in in the creative side and the humanity side who feel those pressures to to go do something quote unquote useful? Yeah, it's it is, it's definitely um, a balancing act. It absolutely is. But I, I would always say to those students, like, you know, definitely follow, follow your instincts. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, be, be practical about it. You know, um, you can get involved with like social issues and social struggles um, at the same time as you're like, you know, working towards a particular, you know, like I said, like you said, professional, like um, professional degree, um, I think. Um, but I think like with, with, with the arts and the humanities and, and those types of subjects, you know, um, you, you definitely have to have, a, have an eye on the future. Right. And you have to have an eye on like um, on being able to support yourself. Right. You know, um, when I was coming out of college, it was it was like um, the, the main goal was to be like, uh, um, I guess, I guess the end the the, the, the the fail safe, the safety net was like, OK, you get the degree. All right. Um, uh, you go and get your master's. Um, you can teach at the college level. That's kind of that's kind of like what I was thinking about as far as like uh, sustaining and, and supporting myself because I'm always going to write and I'm always going to produce and I'm always going to perform. Um, so I was like, let me go ahead and map out the academic life first because I, I see my, my mentors. I see Nikki Giovanni. I, send, I see Tim Siebel's just re retired like a couple of years ago. These people are my mentors and my idols, really. Um, I see that they're in the educational system. And I see that most writers are in the educational uh, uh, system. I mean, or for the most part. You know, I got a few friends that write novels and they turn into movies. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a novelist. I don't have that, you know. Um, but yeah, there's, there's um, a, a part of, uh, I think, the arts and the humanities side. We had to start thinking at least about the business, you know. And as a poet, I was like, I got to think about the business of being a poet. And the business of being a poet is, yeah, there's academia involved. There's publishing houses involved. Um there's performance, you know, I've made, I made a really great career out of just like crisscrossing the country and going into different places and, and mostly school settings, mostly colleges, universities, high schools. That's kind of where you find me at. And it's mostly about craft, right? Process. Um, and with Mission College lately, it's been more about inspiration. 
uh, things of that nature. So I think when students are feeling that pressure to kind of get involved with like, you know, uh, social issues, they should definitely follow that instinct. I'm not sure they can, you know, and there are more careers um, nowadays out there for like more socially minded uh, folks, you know, um, entrepreneurial careers. There's like, you know, uh, uh, all types of uh, uh, jobs, I think, in that that sector. But there are ways that you can benefit Right. Um, uh, from, you know, what you believe in is, is a social or, or moral right, you know, um, in a business sense. You know, you can you can jump into teaching. You know, if you like teaching a certain if you like if you love history, you know, there, you know, you can teach history. You know, you can uh, write history books or whatever. If you like art, you know, I know it's a lot of artists that get into arts education. Um, I got a friend named um, her name is Heather, Heather Bryce. And I think she's from North Carolina. Matter of fact, um, she has a dance company. Um, and, and she, she was a dancer. I knew it was a dancer in college, but she turned it into a company, like a bit, like, you know, it's kind of like Shakespeare's a, a great writer, but he turned it, you know, he, he created this business, business model. She, he, she created the business model and, and, uh, there was a demand for that business model. And so she's out being what, what we call, um, we call it a teaching artist. All right. So most of the teaching artists that I know, they're like, they're, they're teachers, and they're artists as well. They, they kind of do. They kind of do both. And they're like, there's really good spaces for those uh, those types of gigs. I believe that's you know, that's out there. But um, but I understand, like you know, some students are feeling that pressure to to get into STEM and get into the science and the math. And like, I got to get an engineering degree because it pays the bill. <laughs> it pays the bills and things like that. But I think there's more room now. I think there's more room now uh, to get involved with um, um, social issues from like a more of like a business. Uh, uh, kind of standpoint, or you can just do something for the, like, you know, uh, start a business that you think is going to work for the, for the greater good. Um, there's a financial um, expert that I follow. His name is John Hope Bryant. Uh, John Hope Bryant, you know, um, he's an entrepreneur, but he's a, he's a very business savvy uh, guy. And, and uh, he talks about financial literacy. You know, he said he believes that financial literacy is something that um, he said a lot of black folks after slavery didn't have. You know, and he talks about how black folks after slavery had all this land, but within 100 years, most of that land was taken away. You know, either it was by a hook or by a crook, by violence, um, or they just didn't have the education to hold on to it. Um, so he says, like, you know, um, he's more like a, um, there's an activist spirit about him. There's an activist spirit about giving financial advice and getting people to, like, uh, take pride in ownership and owning, owning your home and getting your credit rating up and things like that. He's like, he's like, those rules haven't been published, you know, actually, I mean, actually they kind of are now, but he said basically like, you know, um, the people, when he talked about the black community, he says, well, the, you want to be a great athlete, you want to be an NBA star, the, those rules are published, right? You, you, you have to, you have to work hard. You got to be a great athlete and hopefully you get that opportunity all right, to get to the professional level. He says, those rules are published. You know, he says, you want to be a music star? Those rules are published, like entertainment and stuff like that. He said, those rules are out there. But he said the financial literacy, none of us really get that in high schools. Right? We don't get an understanding of taxes. We don't get an understanding of setting up bank accounts and things like that. Um, so he has an activist spirit. He's all about the social progress, but he's also about like learning the business of the game of America and using it to um, to his advantage. So I think I think you can find a fine balance and 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 be able to like stay committed to your social issues and stay committed uh, to change at the same time be able to kind of sustain yourself and make a make a living i guess <laughs> i got the answer like did i answer enough chaz did i, did I get at it <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, was, that, was, that, was true. that was a decent answer it was adequate <laughs> adequate enough um okay what i got four minutes now um let's see let's see what i got here um i want to go to let's see i have this uh really four minutes okay i got two poems two poems two poems two poems i'll take any questions y'all have anything i want to throw me is perfectly fine um yeah dr Saki says take your time we have you don't yeah you don't okay to feel, you don't have to feel okay. rushed to be done in four minutes okay yeah i'm like yeah i'm, I'm a big like no oh, okay that's cool awesome awesome so i'll take yeah i'll take a little more time then um i wrote this uh really cool um book right here this is called um american reverie um co-wrote actually i co-wrote this book with a guy named Donnell mcgee Donnell mcgee is a professor at uh, Mission College, and that, that was the class I visited. Um, I visited that class uh, last night, and um, this book was was really a labor of love. We started this in 2000. I visited him in California in 2015, um, 
2017, like 2015, we were like, listen, we got to work together and, and put out a some kind of collaboration project. Um, and so America Reverie was that project. This, this just came out in July. All right. And this is available on uh, thetherabooks.com if you want to get a copy of this. All right. So it was more of a call and response effort. All right. We kind of tapped into, you know, the call and response mode of, of creation. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, we created a Google Doc. All right. We created a Google Doc that we're both on. We could both edit it. Right. And so anytime and that was our manuscript. So anytime anybody wrote a poem, I would write a poem. I would text them and say, hey, Donnell, I put a poem in the manuscript or I put two poems or three poems in the manuscript. Take a those look at those poems and, and uh, respond. See what you can come up with. And there was no time. You know, um, we didn't have a time limit or any kind of restraint on us. Um, he basically said, listen, you know, we want to get it prepared for publication. We'll, get, we'll spend a year on it. We'll spend a year on it. And by next August or whatever, we'll stop. We'll edit. We'll revise. We'll process. And then we'll get it prepared uh, uh, for the public. All right. So for a year, we wrote the book. And, and um, sometimes you would write one poem. I would write three. I would write one poem sometimes. You would write like, you know, four or five. Um, and it was, it was organic. It was an organic process that ended up creating this book. And we started, like I said, in 2017, but the book literally is, is about um, dealing with, you know, um, dealing with racism, dealing with police brutality, uh, de dealing with civil unrest. It's, it's definitely an age, uh, a book, you know, for the, the Black Lives Matter uh, kind of uh, uh, thought process, um, I believe. And then once we got around to publishing it, once it uh, uh, started to come out, uh, which was July, just July, July 20. 2020? Right, July 2020, it came out. And I read the final manuscript. I'm like, man, we spent three years on this. But the, the issues in this book are issues we deal with now. And, and that and that's kind of like the, the poetry I like to write. Like, it, it's timeless, right? It's like, okay, he wrote this yesterday. You know, but they spent three years writing this. Um, and so um, I want to read a couple poems uh, from, from it. Um, and I want to st stay focused on family as much as I can here. Uh, this is a poem I wrote. Um, this is for my daughter. This is called um, Baby Girl Needs Me to Part, right? And so we kind of let the inspiration go where, wherever it wanted to go. Whatever he wrote, I would just kind of respond to it. And, and sometimes, you know, I would go in a new, new direction where I would stay in the theme that he's working on. And that's how we uh, processed everything. All right, so this is called Baby Girl Needs Me to Part. I rushed through traffic to handle the business Baby girl needs me to park near a park where she can stretch her spirits like little brown girls, like little black girls born on the other side of the moon. I hustle because she depends on my ambitions. A soul brother, an African brother, my toenails have blackened from walking cold American land. I complete the task. Avoid the crosshairs. Police officers are dangerous to my health. Baby girl needs me to park near a park. I fly because of love and her mission to live, to run, to be free. Poem entitled, Baby Girl Needs Me to Part. And a lot of the poems in this particular book, you know, have that, um, have that, that flair, you know, they have that, um, that connection um, with family, uh, with, with uh, 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 being able to just move in different spaces. Cause like, you know, lately, you know, it seems like with black and brown folks, it was, it, it, especially in the last four years, it became extremely difficult to move in, in some spaces, you know, um, because, you know, we had a, a, a president, right, that was encouraging a lot of this, this, uh, this, this racial animosity. I remember doing an interview for um, the New Journal and Guide, and that's the oldest black, I think it's the oldest black newspaper in Norfolk. Latif, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the oldest black newspaper in, in, in Norfolk, I believe, um, maybe in VA. Um, and I remember doing an interview um, with the chief reporter, his name is Leonard Coven, a good friend of mine. And we were talking about, he's like, you know, what do you think? This is, this is prior to uh, the 2016 election, prior to that. And he's like, he's like, do you think, what do you think about, you know, the possibility of Trump being president? I was like, I was like, nothing in his history suggests that this man <laughs> should ever be, you know, the the, the president yet. Yeah, like she said, correct, thank you, Lee. Um, it, it, Nothing in my mind, nothing in his history um, um, suggests to me that this man should be president. There's so many racial issues um, that I took part, you know, uh, uh, 
that I, I took issue with. Um, Central Park Five, you know, all of that, uh, uh, all of that material, all the, the newspapers she, she, you know, uh, went in and, and uh, uh, basically called for the death penalty for these young black and brown men, and they were later later exonerated. Right, and New York City ended up paying these these guys like forty million, twenty million, it was something ridiculous. Right, um, but uh, so with the last four years um, that we had to deal with, you know, a lot of the poems, a lot of the energy kind of went into the poems of American Reverie. And I remember a kid, a young young student, he said like, okay, what is, you know, I get that the book is called American Reverie. Um, so what's your American dream? And I was like, I was like, I think that you're, you know, uh, looking at this, you know, we're looking, I'm looking at American Reverie as documenting an American nightmare, you know, and and I'm trying to find beauty in the nightmare, beauty in the struggle, I think with, with, these, uh, with these poems. So like, you know, um, it's not really, you know, about, you know, necessarily an American dream. It's really about, you know, uh, talking about the issues um, that have made, you know, life nightmarish, you know, for um, for a lot of people. Um, but I'll read one more poem in this. I think there's one poem I just looked at that I think um, stays, stays, I'm trying to stay in the pocket, as they say, right? Stay in the pocket of, of what we're, what we're uh, focusing on this afternoon. Uh, this is called On the Black Hand Side. Daddy said, defend the home, protect the queen. Fight for sister, flash a middle finger, brandish a crooked smile. I still adhere to rituals, routines, dreams with snipers and clouds. This is a subculture blueprint, a means to function in chaos, a strategy to arm voices. Some say black lives matter, all lives matter, no lives matter. I say, draw a line in sand and be a frontline dreamer. Learn to disrupt the jungle, learn to craft wings. Birds aren't the only ones with distant destinations. I live for respect, for surreal sun, for a child's self-esteem, for blaring music, for the creator's wide breath, his broad salute, her motivating touch. This place is a suite, a place of safety, a place of refuge. I live on the black hand side. Yeah, but the poems in this book were, were definitely uh they definitely fun, definitely fun for uh uh fun to do. Um and it helped me like, you know, that that um it's really interesting because like when you're in the when you're in a studio environment, um, if you're ever in a studio environment and you're working with musicians, all right, there there's a, a you know a place that you all become comfortable with. Um, when you're when you're creating, you know, sometimes it's literally on demand. You know, when you're on your own studio, you can take all the time you want, all day to develop a song. But when you're when you when you have a song, you know you want to get done, and you know it costs a hundred dollars an hour to be in this place. You got to get in there with a game plan. It, it can't be, you know, it can't be no smoke breaks and eating. No, we got we. It's time to work. All right. Um, and so um, the organic process of of developing something and creating something. Um, it, it's so valuable when you get in, in, inside a, a place in a studio with other musicians. With the writers, it's it's kind of the same way. It's kind of the same thing with, with, with Donnell. Um, we had there were there were there were no time you know issues. Um, the content we were free to explore. No one was telling us, "Oh, you got to write about this particular issue." Uh, we just wanted to write an urgent uh, now culture uh, type of book. And I think uh, with that, you know, and his 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 focus on family life. Uh, black and brown family life helped me, you know, a lot develop because it helped me start thinking about, you know, um, what also is important in my life, not just the issues that I like to talk about, but some of the issues that are right here in my own home, right? Uh, or, or, you know, a lot of those stories, you know, I, um, he helped me, you know, talk about. Um, let's see. Um, I think I have, I think there's one other. Okay, here we go. Just like in other poems, I spent like all night in these books, like putting like little post-it <laughs> posts on these things just to make sure I'm in the right place. I was like, okay, this thing, black family life. Okay, let me, let me stay on topic, let me stay in here. But like when you start to read stuff and, and the stories uh, start to uh, start to develop and come out, um, you know, you can't help but to kind of drift into some other, other material. Um, I'll read this poem. Um, I'll do this one. I'll do two, two more right here. Um, and I'll I'll stop you know for Q and A and we can kind of um, start winding things uh, winding things down I believe. All right. Um, our wedding song. 
um, was called um, Point of It All by Anthony Hamilton. All right, um, and actually there's another one of those poems where um, uh, I was in an ICU room, I was thinking about our lives together and just started like, you know, uh, kind of like riffing, you know, just kind of like picking up on a little, oh, all right, wedding song is this, let me, let me go with that. Um, and so this poem is simply called, and the point of it all is love and peace. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. We cultivate earthly bliss with careful fingertips, navigate empire with pride, power, passion, culture. We hang and teach, dream and preach. Circumstances are smaller because we face them while we chase muses, two lesser gods that outrun the night by being still. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. I walk contemptuous earth, leaving hostilities behind, avoiding snake-filled streets, tattooing beliefs in God in the space between my ears. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. I call you friend. Angel, freedom as you enliven the home. Perfume this maze I happily run with dreadlocks growing longer, grayer every day. A follower, living for the music of trust, family, and purpose. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. And the point of it all is love, peace, and this sweet we call heaven. Poem and title, and the point of it all. Um, I want to do one more, one more poem, really cool poem. Um, I got into, let me see if I can get out of this stuff right here. All right, awesome. All right, so um, I have this one uh, pulled up. I want to, there's a, um, my my grandparents, they passed away some years ago. Um, my grandfather, when he passed away, it was like due to complications because of a stroke. Um, and then uh, my my grandmother, she passed away maybe, wow, I want to say maybe five or six years, um, five or six years later, she passed away. Um, and um, at their funerals, you know, um, I was like, you know, since I'm like the, the family poet, I guess, you know, I was, you know, given the opportunity to, to kind of eulogize um, my grandparents. And so I wrote poems for both of them. Um, when they, when they passed and when they, uh, we, we had the funerals, of course, you know, I would read, you know, read the poems, you know, at their, um, at their funerals. All right, this is one poem that I want to read. This is called um, Alive and Well and Alive and Free. My, my grandparents, they're from Mississippi. All right, from, my, my parents are from Mississippi. All right, um, and so, like, to get behind, like, um, everything the people, uh, uh, the people are, Right, everything that people struggle with um, was kind of difficult, and and I wanted to make the poem great. Right, I wanted to make it great, and with funerals, there's a time, you know, there's a time issue. Like, oh, we're having the funeral on Sunday, Tuesday, whatever the day is, and it's like it's usually not something where where you have a lot of time to like, you know, have a month in advance to to you know, it, it was unexpected, and so you know, can you do this? And I was like, absolutely. And my my uh, my, my aunt Aunt Barbara, she's a school teacher. All right, and and she gave me the task. She gave me the actually it wasn't a task; it was a, an assignment. <laughs> she gave me the assignment. All right, and um, I was like, okay, let me go ahead and and jump onto this. The next day, she called and said, "Are you done?" I was like, I was like, oh, Barbara, I just got it. Let me let me give me give me uh give me another twelve hours, twenty four hours, right? Um, so this poem is called um, "Alive and Well, Alive and Free" uh, for Fanny Asleen. Lofted. And uh, what's really interesting now that my 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 grandmother has passed on, um, I started seeing all these relationships. Um, because like Fannie Lou Hamer, right? Latif, right, probably knows the historian, right, from Mississippi as well. Um, apparently uh, my grandmother and Fannie Lou Hamer have some sort of kinship. All right. They uh my my, my uh Fannie Lou Hamer's maiden name, I think, is Townsend. Uh and my grandmother was Fanny Asleen Townsend, all right? And Fanny Lou Hamer's people came from like the Delta region of Mississippi or whatever it was. My grandmother, her sisters, they all came from the same. So 
there's a really cool kinship. There may be a kinship there, I believe. Um, but I think like oh, upon my research, um, I eventually, I eventually ran to like a wall where like, you know, I got as far as I can get on her, her side of the family, her family tree. And um, I just hit a wall and I couldn't make the relationship. I couldn't tell if uh, Fannie, Fannie Lou Hamer had, I don't know if they were cousins or what, what they, what they, what they were, but there was some kinship there. All right, but this is the poem, Alive and Well, Alive and Free. Go down, children, way down to the land where the mockingbirds know the souls of a proud people. Tell the kinfolk and friends she has moved on, she's alive and well, she's alive and free. I hear her lessons, they skip, so for ideas on old Eddie Lee Road, a gentle blues plays a beautiful sound. Her legacy lives on my skin. I remember her voice, it still walks with me. Provides comfort when sons re refuse to flash their smiles. I smile because her DNA is a part of, of mine. Go down children, way down to the land where the mockingbirds know the souls of a proud people. Tell the kinfolk and friends she has moved on, she's alive and well, she's alive and free. Her stories intertwine with mine, her bloodline mixes, creates, and laughs through mine. She departs for the most high and falls in line with the others. They have earned their wings, their places, their spaces, their reasons to be, to breathe, to fly. I hear her lessons. They skip perfumed insights on old Eddie Lee Road. A gentle blues plays a beautiful sound. Her legacy lives on my skin. Go down, children. Way down to the land where the mockingbirds know the souls of our proud people. Tell the kinfolk and friends she has moved on. She's alive and well. She's alive and free. Poem entitled Alive and Well and Alive and 